three. Final it book reading. Part seven of this particular chapter. Under the city, 4.15 p.m. Eddie led them through the darkened tunnels for an hour. Perhaps an hour and a half before admitting in a tone that was more bewildered than threatened that for the first time in his life he was lost. They could still hear the dim thunder of water in the drains, but the acoustics of all of these tunnels was so crazed that it was impossible to tell if the water sounds were coming from ahead or behind, left or right, above or below. Their matches were gone. They were lost in the dark. Bill was scared. Plenty scared. The conversation he'd had with his father in his father's shop kept coming back to him. There's nine pounds of blueprints that had just disappeared somewhere along the line. My point is that nobody knows where all the damned sewers and drains go, or why. When they work, nobody cares. When they don't, there's three or four sad sacks from dairy water who have to try and find out which pump went fluey, or where the plug-up is. It's dark and smelly, and there are rats. There are all good reasons to stay out. They are, but the best reason is that you could get lost. It's happened before, happened before, happened before it's happened, sure it had. There was that bundle of bones and polished cotton they had passed on the way to its lair, for instance. Phil felt panic trying to rise and pushed it back. It went, but not easily. He could feel it back there, a live thing, struggling and twisting, trying to get out. Adding to it was the nagging, unanswerable question of whether they had killed it or not. Richie said yes, Mike said yes, so did Eddie, but he hadn't liked the frightened, doubtful look on Bev's face sore on Stan's as the light died and they crawled back through the small door, away from the susurrating, collapsing web. So what do we do now? Stan asked. Bill heard the frightened little boy tremble in Stan's voice and knew the question was aimed directly at him. Yeah, Ben said. What? Damn, I wish we had a flashlight or even a can candle. Bill thought he heard a stifled sob in the second ellipsis. It frightened him more than anything else. Bill would have been astounded to know it, but Bill thought the fat boy, tough and resourceful, steadier than Richie and less apt to cave in suddenly than Stan. If Ben was getting ready to crack, they were on the edge of very bad trouble. It was not the skeleton of the water department guy to watch Bill's own mind kept returning, but the Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher lost in McDougal's cave. He would push the thought away, and then it would come stealing back. Something else was troubling him, but the concept was too large and too vague for his tired boy's mind to grasp. Perhaps it was the very simplicity of the idea that made it elusive. They were falling away from each other. The bond that had held them all this long summer was dissolving. It had been faced and vanquished. It might be dead, as Richie and Eddie thought, or it might be wounded so badly it would sleep for a hundred years or a thousand or ten thousand. They had faced it it with its final mask laid aside and it had been horrible enough oh for sure but once seen its physical form was not so bad and its most potent weapon was taken away from it they all had after all seen spiders before they were all alien and somehow crawlingly dreadful and he supposed that none of them would ever be able to see another one if we ever get out of this without feeling a shudder of revulsion but a spider was, after all, only a spider. Perhaps at the end, when the masks of horror were laid aside, there was nothing with which the human mind could not cope. That was a heartening thought. Anything except the deadlights. Whatever had been out there. Perhaps even that unspeakable living light which crouched out the doorway to the macroverse was dead or dying. The deadlights. And the trip into the black to the place where they had been was already growing hazy and hard to recall in his mind. And that wasn't really the point. The point felt but not grasped was simply that the fellowship was ending. It was ending and they were still in the dark. That other had, through their friendship, perhaps been able to make them something more than children. But they were becoming children again. Bill felt it as much as the others. What now, Bill? Richie asked, finally saying it right out. I don't know, Bill said. His daughter was back alive and well, he heard it, he heard it, and he stood in the dark, smelling the sodden aroma of their growing panic, wondering how long it would be before somebody, Stan, most likely it would be Stan, tore things wide open by saying, well, why don't you? No, you got us into this, 
And what about Henry? Mike asked uneasily. Is he still out there or what? Oh, geez, Eddie said. Almost moaned. I forgot about him. Sure he is. Sure he is. He's probably as lost as we are, and we could run into him any time. Geez. Bill, don't you have any ideas? Your dad works down here. Don't you have any ideas at all? Bill listened to the distant mocking thunder of the water and tried to have the idea that Eddie, all of them, had a right to demand. Because, yes, correct, he had gotten them into this and it was his responsibility to get them back out again. Nothing came. Nothing. I have an idea, Beverly said quietly. In the dark, Bill heard a sound he could not immediately place. A whispering little sound, but not scary. Then there was a more easily placed sound. A zipper. What? He thought, and then he realized what? She was undressing, for some reason. Beverly was undressing. What are you doing? Richie asked, and his shocked voice cracked on the last word. I know something, Beverly said in the dark. And to Bill, her voice sounded older. I know because my father told me. I know how to bring us back together. And if we're not together, we'll never get out. What? Ben asked, sounding bewildered and terrified. What are you talking about? Something that will bring us together forever. Something that will show. No, 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 Beverly, Bill said, some suddenly understanding, understanding everything. That will show that I love you all, Beverly said, that you're all my friends. What's she, t Mike began calmly. Beverly cut across his words. Who's first, she asked, I think, part eight of this particular chapter. In the lair of it, 1985. He's dying, Beverly wept. His arm, it ate his arm. She reached for Bill, clung to him, and Bill shook her off. It's getting away again. He roared at her. Blood caked his lips and chin. C -c come on, Richie, B Ben, this time we're going to finish her. Richie turned Bill toward him, looked at him as he would look at a man who was hopelessly raving. Bill, we have to take care of Eddie. We have to get a tourniquet on him. Get him out of here. But Beverly was now sitting with Eddie's head in her lap, cradling him. She had closed his eyes. Go with Bill, she said. If you let him die for nothing, if it comes back in another 25 years or 50 or even 2,000, I swear I'll... I'll haunt your ghost. Go! Richie looked at her for a moment, indecisive. Then he became aware that her face was losing definition, becoming not a face that a pale shape, but a pale shape in the growing shadows. The light was fading. It decided him. All right, he said to Bill. This time we chase. Ben was standing in back of the spider web, which had begun to decay again. He had also been the shape, swaying high up in it. Seen. The shape swaying high up in it, and he prayed that Bill would not look up. But as the web began to fall in drifts and strands and skeins, Bill did. He saw Audra sagging as if in a very old and creaky elevator. She dropped ten feet, stopped swaying from side to side, and then abruptly dropped another fifteen. Her face never changed. Her eyes, china blue, were wide open. Her bare feet swung back and forth like pendulums. Her hair hung lankly over her shoulders. Her mouth was ajar. Audra, he screamed. Bill, come on. Ben shouted. The web was falling all around them now, thudding to the floor and beginning to run. Rutschy suddenly grabbed Bill around the waist and propelled him forward, shooting for a ten-foot-high gap between the floor and the bottommost cross strand of the sagging web. Go, Bill. Go. That's Audra. Bill shouted desperately. That, that's Audra. I don't give a shit if it's the Pope, Richie said grimly. Eddie's dead and we're going to kill it. If it's still alive, we're going to finish the job this time, Big Bill. Either she's alive or she's not. Now come on. Bill hung back a moment longer and then snapped shots of the children. All the dead children seemed to flutter through his mind like lost photographs from George's album, School Friends. Uh, all right, let's go. God, forgive me. Me and Richie... Ran under the strand of cross webbing seconds before it collapsed and joined Ben on the other side. They ran after it as all just swung and dangled fifty feet above the stone floor, wrapped in a numbing cocoon that was attached to the decaying web. Part nine of this particular chapter. Ben. They followed the trail of its black blood, oily pools of ichor that ran and dripped into the cracks between the flagstones, but as the floor began to rise toward a semicircular black opening, at the far side of the chamber, Ben saw something new, a trail of eggs, which was black and rough-shelled, perhaps as big as an ostrich egg. A waxy light shone from within them. Ben realized they were semi-transparent. He could see black shapes moving inside. It's children, he thought, 
and felt his gorge rise. It's miscarried children. God, God. Richie and Bill had stopped and were staring at the eggs with stupid, dazed wonder. Go on, go on, Ben shouted. I'll take care of them. Get it. Here, Richie shouted and threw Ben a pack of Dairy Town House matches. Ben caught them. Bill and Richie ran on. Ben watched them in the rapidly dimming light for a moment. They ran into the darkness of its escape passage and were lost from sight. Then he looked down at the first of the thin-shelled eggs. The thin-shelled eggs at the black. Meant to like shadow inside and felt his determination waver. This. Hey guys, this was too much. This was simply too awful. And surely they would die without his help. They had not been so much late as dropped. But its time was close. And if one of them was capable of surviving even one... <clears throat> Summoning all of his courage, summoning up Eddie's pale, dying face, Ben brought one dessert driver boot down on the first egg. It broke with a sudden squelch as some stinking placenta ran out around his boot. Then a spider the size of a rat was scrabbling weakly across the floor, trying to get away, and Ben could hear it in his head. Its high mewling cries like the sound of a handsaw being bent rapidly back and forth so that it makes ghost music. Ben lurched after it on legs that felt like stilts and brought his foot down again. He felt the spider's body crunch and splatter under the heel of his boot. His gorge clenched and this time there was no way he could hold back. He vomited, then twisted his heel, grinded the thing into the stones, listening to the cries in his head fade to nothing. How many, how many eggs? Didn't I read somewhere that spiders can lay thousands or millions? I can't keep doing this, I'll go mad. You have to. You have to. Come on, Ben. Get it together. He went to the next egg. He repeated the process in the last of the dying light. Everything was repeated. The brittle snap. The squelch of liquid. The final coup de grace. The next. The next. The next. Making his way slowly toward the black arch into which his friends had gone. The darkness was complete now. Beverly and the decaying webs somewhere behind him. He could still hear the whisper of its collapse. The eggs were pallid stones in the dark. As he reached each one, he struck a light from the mesh book and broke it open. In each case, he was able to follow the course of the day's spiderland and crush it before the light flickered out. He had no idea how he was going to proceed if his matches gave out before he had crushed the last of the eggs and killed each one's unspeakable cargo. Part 10 of this particular chapter. It, 1985, still coming. It sensed them still coming. Gaining. And its fear grew. Perhaps it was not eternal after all. The unthinkable must finally be thought. Worse, it sensed the death of its young. A third of these hated, hateful men boys was walking steadily up its trail of birth, almost insane with revulsion, but continuing nonetheless, methodically stamping the life form. the life from each of its eggs. No, it wailed, lurching from side to side feeling its life force running from a hundred wounds, none of them mortal in itself, but each a song of pain, each slowing it. One of its legs hung by a single living twist of meat. One of its eyes was blind. It sensed a terrible rupture inside, the result of whatever poison one of the hated men boys had managed to shoot down its throat. And still they came on, closing the distance, and how could this happen? It whined and mewled and... When it sensed them almost directly behind, it did the only thing it could do now. It turned to fight. <clears throat> Part 11 of this particular chapter. Beverly. Before the last of the light faded and utter dark closed down, she saw Bill's wife plunge another 20 feet and then fetch up again. She had begun to spin, her long red hair fanning out. His wife, she thought, but I was his first love, and if he thought some other woman was his first, it was only because he forgot, forgot Derry. And then she saw in, she was in darkness, alone with the sound of the falling web and Eddie's simple moveless weight. She didn't want to let him go, didn't want to let his face lie on the soul. 
foul floor of this place, so she held his head in the crook of an arm that had gone mostly numb and brushed his hair away from his damp forehead. She thought of the birds. That was something she supposed she had gotten from Stan. Poor Stan, who hadn't been able to face this. All of them. I was their first love. She tried to remember it. It was something good to think about in all this darkness. Where you couldn't place the sounds, it made her feel less alone. At first it wouldn't come. The image of the birds intervened. Crows and grackles and starlings. Spring birds that came back from somewhere while the streets were still running with meltwater and the last patches of crusted dirt or snow clung grimly to their shady places. It seemed to her that it was always on a cloudy day that you first heard and saw those spring birds and wondered where they came from. Suddenly they were just back in Derry, filling the white air with their raucous chatter. They lined the telephone wires and roof peaks of the Victorian houses on West Broadway. They jostled for places on the aluminum branches of the elaborate TV antenna on top of Wally Spa. They loaded the wet, black branches of the elms on Lower Main Street. They settled. They talked to each other in the screamy, babbling voices of old country women at the weekly Grange Bingo Games. And then, at some signal which humans could not discern, they all took wing at once, turning the sky black with their numbers. And came down somewhere else. Yes, the birds. I was thinking of them because I was ashamed. It was my father who made me ashamed, I guess. And maybe that was its doing. Too, maybe. The memory came. The memory behind the birds. But it was vague and disconnected. Perhaps this one always would be. She had. Her thoughts broke off as she realized that Eddie. Part 12 of this particular chapter. <clears throat> Love and Desire. August 10th, 1958, comes to her first because he is the most frightened. He comes to her not as her friend of that summer or as her brief lover now, but the way he would have come to his mother only three or four years ago to be comforted. He doesn't draw back from her smooth nakedness and at first she doubts if he even feels it. He is trembling, and although she holds him, the darkness is so perfect that even this close she cannot see him, except for the rough cast he might as well be a phantom. What do you want? He asks her. You have to put your thing in me, she says. He tries to pull back, but she holds him and he subsides against her. She has heard someone. Then she thinks, draw in his breath. Bevy, I can't do that. I don't know how. I think it's easy, but you'll have to get undressed. She thinks about the intricacies of managing cast and shirt. First, somehow separating and then rejoining them. And amends, your pants anyway. No, I can't. But she thinks part of him can and wants to because his trembling has stopped and she feels something small and hard which presses against the right side of her belly. You can, she says, and pulls him down. The surface beneath her bare back and legs is firm, clay, dry. The distant thunder of the water is drowsy, soothing. She reaches for him. There is a moment when her father's face intervenes, harsh and forbidding. I want to see if you're intact. And then she closes her arms around Eddie's neck her smooth cheek against his smooth cheek, and as he tentatively touches her small breast, she sighs and thinks for the first time this is Eddie, and she remembers the day in July. Could it only have been last month, when no one else turned up in the barrens but Eddie, and he had a whole bunch of little Lulu comic books, and they read together for most of the afternoon, little Lulu looking for blue bull berries and getting in all sorts of crazy situations. Witch Hazel, all of those guys, it had been fun. She thinks of birds, in particular of the grackles and starlings and crows that come back in the spring, and her hands go to his belt and loosen it, and he says again that he can't do that. She tells him that he can. She knows he can, and what she feels is not shame or fear now, but a kind of triumph. Where? He says, and that hard thing pushes urgently against her inner thigh. Here, she says, baby, I'll fall on you, he says, and she hears his breath starting to whistle painfully. I think that's sort of the idea. She tells him and holds him gently and guides him. He pushes forward too fast, and there is pain. She draws her breath in, her teeth biting at her lower lip and thinks of the birds again, the spring birds, lining the roof peaks of houses, taking wing all at once under the low marsh clouds. Beverly, he says uncertainly, are you okay? Go slower, she says. It'll be easier for you to breathe. He does move more slowly and after a while his breathing speeds up, but she understands this is not because there is nothing, anything wrong with him. The pain fades. Suddenly, he moves more quickly, then stops, stiffens, and makes a sound. Some sound. She senses that this is something for him. 
something extraordinarily special, something like, like flying. She feels powerful. She feels a sense of triumph rise up strongly within her. Is this what her father was afraid of? Well, he might be. There was power in this act, all right, a chain-breaking power that was blood deep. She feels no physical pleasure, but there was a kind of mental ecstasy in it for her. She senses the closeness. He puts his face against her neck, and she holds him. He's crying. She holds him, and feels the part of him that made a connection between them begin to fade. It is not leaving her, exactly. It is simply fading, becoming less. When his weight shifts away, she sits up and touches his face in the darkness. Did you? Did I what? <clears throat> Whatever it is, I don't know exactly. He shakes his head. She feels it with her hand against his cheek. I don't think it was exactly like, you know, like the big boys say, but it was, it was really something. He speaks low, so the others can't hear. I love you, baby. Her consciousness breaks down a little there. She's quite sh sure there's more talk. Some whispered, some loud, and can't remember what is said. It doesn't matter. Does she have to talk? Each of them into it all over again? Yes, probably, but it doesn't matter. They have to be talked into it. This essential human link between the world and the infinite. The only place where the bloodstream touches eternity. It doesn't matter. What matters is love and desire. Here in this dark is as good as a place as any. Better than some, maybe. Mike comes to her, then Richie, and the act is repeated. Now she feels some pleasure. Dim heat in her childish, unmatured sex, and she closes her eyes as Stan comes to her, and she thinks of the birds, spring in the birds, and she sees them again and again, all lighting at once, filling up the winter naked trees, shockwave riders on the moving edge of nature's most violent season. She sees them take wing again and again, the flutter of their wings like the snap of many sheets on the line, and she thinks... A month from now, every kid in Dairy Park will have a kite and they'll run to keep the strings from getting tangled with each other. She thinks again, this is what flying is like. With Stan, as with the others, there is that rueful sense of fading, of leaving, with whatever they truly need from this act. Some ultimate close, but as yet fun found. Did you? She asks again, and although she doesn't know exactly what it is, she knows that he hasn't. There was a long wait, and then Ben comes to her. He is trembling all over, but it is not the fearful trembling she felt in Stan. Beverly, I can't. He says in a tone which purports to be reasonable and is anything but. You can too. I can feel it. She sure can. There's more of this hardness, more of him. She can feel it below the gentle push of his belly. His size raises a certain curiosity, and she touches the bulge lightly. He groans against her neck, and the blow of his breath causes her bare body to dimple with goosebumps. She feels the first twist of real heat race through her. Suddenly, the feeling in her is very large. She recognizes it is too big, and he is too big. Can she take that into herself? And too old for her, something, some feeling that walks in boots. This is like Emery's M80s, this is like Henry's M80s, something not meant for kids, something that could explode and blow you up. But this was not the place or time for worry. Here there was love, desire, and the dark. If they didn't try for the first two, they would surely be left with the last. Beverly, don't. Yes, I... <clears throat> Show me how to fly, she says with a calmness she doesn't feel aware by the fresh, wet warmth on her cheek and neck that he has begun to cry. Show me, Ben. No. If you wrote the poem, show me. Feel my hair if you want to, Ben. It's all right. Beverly, I, I, I. He's not just trembling now, he's shaking all over. But she senses again that this cue is not all fear. Part of it is the precursor of the throw this act is all about. She thinks of the birds, his face. His dear, sweet, earnest face and knows it is not fear. It is wanting he feels, a deep, passionate wanting now, barely held in check. And she feels that sense of power again, something like flying, something looking down from above and seeing all the birds on the roof peaks, on the TV antenna atop wallies, seeing streets spread out, map like, oh, desire, right? This was something, it was love and desire that taught you to fly. Then, yes. She cries suddenly and the leash breaks. She feels pain again, and for a moment there is the frightening sensation of being crushed. Then he props himself up on the palms of his hands and that feeling is gone. He's big. Oh yes, the pain is back and it's much deeper than when Eddie first entered her. She has to bite her lip again and think of the birds until the burning is gone, but it does go. And she is able to reach up and touch his lips with his one finger, and he moans. The heat is back. 
and she feels her power suddenly shift to him, and she gives it gladly and goes with it. There is a sensation first of being rocked, of a delicious spiraling sweetness which makes her begin to turn her head helplessly from side to side, and a tuneless humming comes from between her closed lips. This is flying. This, oh love, oh desire, oh this is something impossible to deny. Binding, giving, making a strong circle, binding, giving, flying, oh Ben, oh my dear, yes, she whispers, feeling the sweat stand out on her face, feeling their connection, something firmly in place, something like eternity, the number eight, rocked over on its side, I love you so much, dear, and she feels the thing begin to happen, something of which the girls who whisper and giggle about sex in the girls' room have no idea, at least as far as she knows. They only marvel at how gushy sex must be, and now she realizes that for many of them, sex must be some unrealized, undefined monster. They refer to the act as it. Would you do it? Do your sister and her boyfriend do it? Do your mom and dad still do it? And how they never intend to do it. Oh yes, you would think that the whole girl's side of the 5th grade class was made up of spinsters to be, and it is obvious to Beverly that none of them can suspect this this conclusion, and she is only kept from screaming by her knowledge that the others will hear and think her badly hurt. She puts the side of her hand in her mouth and bites down hard. She understands the screaming laughter of Greta Bowie and Salem, Sally Mueller and all the others better now, hadn't they? The seven of them spent most of this, the longest, scariest summer of their lives, laughing like loons. You laugh because what's fearful and unknown is also what's funny. You laugh the way a small child will sometimes laugh and cry at the same time when a capering circus clown approaches, knowing it is supposed to be funny, but it is also unknown, full of the unknown's eternal power. Biting her hand will not stay the cry, and she can only reassure them and Ben by crying out her affirmative in the darkness. Yes, yes, yes. Glorious images of flight fill her head, mixing with the harsh calling of the grackles and starlings. These sounds become the world's sweetest music. So she flies, she flies up, and now the power is not with her or with him, but somewhere between them. And he cries out. She can feel his arms trembling, and she arches up and into him, Feeling his spasm, his touch, his total fleeting intimacy with her in the dark. They break through into the life light together. Then it is over, and they are in each of their arms, and when he tries to say something, perhaps some stupid apology that would hurt what she remembers, some stupid apology like a handcuff, she stops his words with a kiss and sends him away. Bill comes to her. He tries to say something, but his stutter is almost total now. You be quiet, she says. Secure in her new knowledge, but aware that she is tired now. Tired and damn sore. The insides and backs of her thighs feel sticky, and she thinks it's maybe because Ben actually finished, or maybe because she is bleeding. Everything is going to be totally okay. Are you sure? Yes, she says, and links her hands behind his neck, feeling the sweaty mat of his hair. You just bet. Da -da 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 it's not as if it was bed, but but it's it's not as it's it, as it is not as it was with Ben. There is passion, but not the same kind. Being with Bill now was the best conclusion to this that there could be. He is kind, tender, just sort of calm. She senses his eagerness, but it is tempered and held back by his anxiety for her, perhaps because only Bill and she herself realize what an enormous act this is, and how it must never be spoken of, not to anyone else, not even to each other. At the end, she is surprised by that sudden upsurge, and she has time to think, oh, it's going to happen again, I don't know if I can stand it. But her thoughts are swept away by the utter sweetness of it, and she barely hears him whispering, I love you, Bev. I love you, I always love you, saying it over and over and not stuttering at all. She hugs him to her, and for a moment they stay that way, his smooth cheek against hers. He withdraws from her without saying anything, and for a little while she's alone, pulling her clothes back together, slowly putting them on, aware of a dull throbbing pain, of which they, being male, will never know, aware also a certain exhausted pleasure of, you know, 
and the relief of having it over. There was an emptiness down there now, and although she is glad that her sex is her own again, the emptiness imparts of a strange melancholy which she could never express except to think of bare trees under a white winter sky. Empty trees. Trees waiting for blackbirds to come like ministers at the end of March to preside over the death of snow. She finds them by groping for their hands. For a moment, no one speaks, and when someone does, it does not surprise her much, that is Eddie. I think that... I think when we went right two turns back, we should have gone left. Jeez, I knew that, but I was so sweaty and freaked up. Been freaked up your whole life, Ed, Richie says. His voice is pleasant. The raw edge of panic is completely gone. We went wrong some other places, too, Eddie says, ignoring him. But that's the worst one. If we can find our way back there, we just might be okay. They form up in a clumsy line, Eddie first, Beverly second now, her hand on Eddie's shoulder as Mike's is on hers. They begin to move again, faster this time. Eddie displays none of his former nervous care. We're going home, she thinks, and shivers with relief and joy. Home, yes, and that will be good. We've done our job, and what we came for, and now we can go back to just being kids again. And that would be good, too. As they move through the dark, she realizes the sound of running water is closer. And now, I will stop this and finish the last it book reading. And the next video. See you soon. JakeTonson19.com Creativity with a passion for a purpose. To entertain, to inspire, to motivate. Peace. See you soon.